So in the last video, we talked about the different kinds of earthquake waves, and you see some of them represented here in the screen. And we talked about how P waves are body waves that go to the inside of the rock, and they travel basically on a longitudinal direction because they go back and forth, as you can see here, and they travel across the rock forward and forward, as you can see happening in the, in the top, right? So you see how the waves progress that way. And we're going to do a demonstration of this in class so it can make a little more, more sense using uh, slinkies. And I'm going to be recording that, hopefully putting it up on YouTube so you guys can watch it as well. But the S waves, instead of, uh, of you applying the stress by compression, or in other words, by hitting with the hammer on the bottom, we're going to talk about that in a second, it, it, it will be more like a sideways propagation. So like the wave is kind of going, uh, kind of like doing an S shape kind of thing. And that's kind of, you see... It's a different kind of body wave, but it still goes through the inside of the rock. And this one, though, it will be a little slower and incapable of going through liquids or air. And we'll talk about that in a second. Then you have the love wave and a rally wave, which are surface waves generated by the P and the S wave as they reach the epicenter at the surface and they spread from the epicenter towards, uh, towards around uh, the area of the earthquake. And the rally waves look like the major ocean waves that you know of. As you can see, they affect the top more than they affect the bottom. As you go deep, they become less and less effective. Now, love waves are even more destructive, and you see how they're actually kind of like shear stress. Um, I think of uh, a combination, both of them are combinations of, shear, uh, of, of P waves and S waves, but the surface waves of the love waves are kind of like going side to side and rolling at the same time. That's what creates this pattern of motion that's very, very destructive. In fact, the surface waves are way more destructive than the body waves. In, uh, in fact, if I were to say the order of speed and power, the love wave would be the most destructive but the slowest, followed by the rally wave, which is going to be the second most destructive and, and then the second most slow. And that's because it's, it would take a lot of power to move the ground in these ways. And so you can think of the, how powerful the earthquake must, must be to literally pick up the ground and move it up and down like that. And then you want to have the S wave, uh, and then finally the P wave, which is the fastest but weakest of all the waves. And you see another representation here of the same pattern, and you see how the P wave, how these pieces here, you can actually see how they're compressed, all right, and how they, uh, away from the actual wave, they're stretched. So this area up there is stretched, but this area in the middle here is compressed. And so it's compression stress that's making that happen. And you can see how the S wave is being created by the, uh, a shear stress, which puts one side one way and the other one the other way. And so that's what creates that familiar S shape. And you see the rolling rally waves up and down and the rocking love waves. Okay? Now you also see in a seismogram, which is measured by a seismograph, which is a device that's used to measure the intensity and occurrence of seismic waves that P waves will usually arrive first because they're faster. You see the P wave arrived over here followed by the S waves over here and so you can see that P waves will travel faster since they're compression stress and it takes less power to make the ground move that way which will allow it to move faster and so this actually here puts them in order of from, from fastest to slowest and also in the order from least to most destructive as you see in the screen. Now another thing I would like to explain is why the P wave and the S wave act different and what causes them and what creates them. The whole thing is that the, during an earthquake both shear stress and compression stress are generated at the rock as the rock undergoes its elastic rebound. And that's going to create different things happening in the rock. So let's talk about that. So for example, when the P wave is generated, what's actually happening is that stress is being applied longitudinally to the rock. Now remember we talked about this longitudinal strain happens when the, the pressure is applied in the same axis as the object itself, so that it is only in one direction. And so what's going to happen here is that this is going to cause the compression of layers of, of, of molecules and then this pro compression will propagate from molecule to molecule. So I think of compression like this. If you were to get basically a hammer, all right, and then kind of just like, excuse me for my hammer, but if you were to like hit this molecule here, then that molecule would then hit another molecule, and that molecule would hit another molecule, and that molecule would hit another molecule, and so forth. But remember that as they hit the molecule, they will actually reflect off the molecule or bounce back from the molecule, and so you're going to have a return. 
you're going to have a return coming from it because you hit it. And so as you hit one, you hit the other, you hit the other, you hit the other. And at the same time, these are going back and forth, which basically the overall result is you're going to get a back and forth motion of these molecules in the wave because you got you hit them. Uh, the best way to think of that is to basically get a slinky and send a pulse through the slinky. You will see that it will hit one, it will hit the other, it will hit the other, hit the other, and we'll do a demonstration of that in class so you can actually see what we're talking about. But that's why this will actually propagate to any kind of substance because it don't matter if this is liquid, solid, or gas. All you need is for a molecule to hit another molecule to hit another molecule to hit another molecule and then we flat back from the other molecule and so forth. And then you're going to end up getting this pattern of propagation uh, through the thing. And this is actually very fast. It's kind of like an energy transfer kind of thing. It's like or a conduction of the energy of the wave. Now, when you do an S wave, you are not doing that at all. What you're actually doing is, as you see in the picture here, is this if you get in the mallet and you hit the side of the object. So, like, for example, uh, assume you have a, a solid which has molecules connected to each other, as you see, like this. So, these molecules are going to be connected to each other. So, each circle represents a molecule in a solid. And remember that in a solid, these molecules are going to be structurally connected by bonds. Now, if you were to get or hammer and then hammer down here and strike this object here, that object will then, of course, push that object in that direction as well. But as soon as that happens, what's going to happen is you're going to get something that looks like this. You're going to have the object kind of stretch up in relationship to the other ones, which are going to like, where are you going, man? Why are you moving? And so that is going to basically, that movement of that move that up is going to basically drag that object to move forward as well. And so what, because you move that one up, you're going to move that object as well. But then, of course, at the same time that is happening, you're going to start getting this one moving backwards because that object there is saying, hey, hold on, come back, where are you going? So this, the attraction between these two objects here will be dragging them back to normal so at the same time that those will be dragging them forward the ones which weren't moving before will be dragging those backwards and then the overall result is that but but just a few seconds later you're gonna have that moving upwards and then those original two are again returning back to normal and then you have the third now the third set of or the third pair which is also again push higher because of the attraction that it has with this so because of the attraction it has with this it will be moved higher but because of the attraction it has with this it will also drag that lower as well and so as you go through the object you're going to have this alternating patterns of molecules moving back and forth and that will propagate you to the object but you see this whole thing dependent on the attraction between the molecules that must exist between these molecules so in a solid in a solid, you have this connection between the molecules. In a solid, the molecules are attached to each other in crystalline structures where they're actually basically one. But if you have a gas or a liquid, these connections might not be as strong. In a liquid, the connections are broken and re-established every second. In a, in a gas, there's basically no connection. And so if you drag this molecule up, basically if you hit this molecule with the mallet, Oh, so this will be a solid, and we talked about it already. This will be, say, a gas, for example, or a liquid. The liquid, of course, move a little bit because it does have some connection, but it's very tenuous and fluctuating connections. It's not like the solid. So if you were to hit this molecule, all it's going to do is it's going to hit that molecule, forcing it to go upwards, and then the other ones are not going to be affected because they do not have the connection that should exist between them that existed up here. Which means S waves cannot go through liquids or gas. They can only go through solids where strong connections exist between the molecules, allowing the shear stress to propagate the way we discussed. And that explains why P waves will go through anything and why solid S waves will only go through solids. And that's going to be important when we talk about how we use seismic waves to study the layers of the Earth. And so remember that, okay? All right, now. To do a final review of the patterns for these waves, I'm going to talk about the three different things. First, let's talk about speed and intensity. 
the strongest wave or the is going to be the love wave or the most destructive wave is going to be the love wave followed by the rally wave followed by the s wave followed the p wave so from weakest to strongest in terms of destructive power the love wave will usually be the most destructive and the p wave will be the most uh, least destructive now basically the p wave will feel like the ground is kind of like trembling the S wave will feel like the ground is going from side to side. The rally wave will feel like the ground is going up and down. And the love wave will make the ground roll and that being very, very destructive. For buildings, love waves are very problematic because the buildings don't know how to deal with that kind of stress in all different directions. It's almost like though the, the love wave is the most, is the mo most affected by S waves while the rally wave is more affected by P waves. So it's like when it hits the surface, the P waves become rallies and the S waves become love. But it's actually both are actually a combination of, of both, of S and, and P wave and S wave as they hit the surface. But that's the pattern that you see. But either way, that's destructive power and also in intensity. Now, in terms of speed, uh, it's easier to move the ground as the P wave moves it than the way the love wave moves it. So the weakest, least destructive of the waves is actually going to be the fastest moving of them all. And so you're going to have S, you're going to have P, S, rally, and then love in terms of speed of propagation of these waves. All right? And we already discussed the way the molecules move. And the last thing is also the propagation. And remember that ra rally waves and love waves are only going to happen at the surface of a solid, and it's only going to affect the very first 100 meters of, of rock or so. While P and S waves will go deep into the earth, and sometimes even across the earth, we flat backwards to the first original spot and so forth. They're very, very well propagating through the earth, through the body of the rock itself. However, the S wave can only go through solids. It cannot go through liquids because it requires the connection that exists between solid molecules in order to propagate with shear stress like we just talked in this video all right now in our next video we're going to talk about how seismic waves can be used to study the layers of the earth plate boundaries and subduction and other things in plate tectonics all right and i'll see you guys then